In part one of this interview, Yoda puppeteer and voice actor Frank Oz talks about the challenges of bringing the character to life, the story behind his backward speech, and monkeys. It starts now. Hello, Frank Oz. Hello, Jamie. So uh, we've spoken before, and for some reason you've agreed to do it again. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm I'm uh, reassessing that decision right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll keep going before you change your mind. Uh, but that was for BBC Radio. Uh, we talked about uh, your Muppets career and also the great Muppet Guys talking documentary that you produced with your wife, Victoria Le bon. As a puppeteer, writer, director for stage, screen, a producer, actor, performer, I've probably missed things out. A man with a pretty varied resume that you're still adding to. Star Wars was really a pit stop for you, in a way, I suppose. Is that... Fair to say, or do you feel like it has been a constant throughout a big chunk yeah, of your career? I think it's fair to say it was a pit stop, and, and, and it was a rich pit stop, and it was a very fortunate and blessed pit stop. I have a lot of things going on, so it's not as if I wait for to do Star Wars every 20 years. Uh, but whenever I'm asked, uh, it's a joy uh, because uh, the character's in my heart, and that's that gives me an opportunity to, to do him. Because I don't do him otherwise. I don't do him. I don't do my voice for anybody. I don't, you know, do anything like that. Why is that? And also, you you don't really do the, the fan conventions either. Is there a specific reason for it? Uh, the fan conventions. Uh, I, I I don't like doing the fan conventions, and I don't like doing. I was on the parade in at Disney once, and I don't like it because I can't talk to anybody. It's a uh, an artificial atmosphere. If I sat and had a beer or coffee with somebody from the comic, that'd be different. I would learn about their lives. And whenever there's a crowd around, I can't really talk to people individually. So it bothers me. I, I, I don't want to be a figure there that stands for something. I, I, I'm curious about other people too. And what about the voice? It feels like I'm attacking you here. Well, but what's the reason the behind voice, that? Voices, there's three reasons. The first is the most important, which is, and that's all my characters, not just Yoda. They're very pure. And if I did the voice, I would be taking them out of context. I think I would betray the audience if I screwed around and betray my sense of who they were. If they, you know, if I did the voices all the time. Once in a great while, if I meet a little kid at an airport and they're really sincere, I might take them aside and say a few words, but that's rare. Second reason is because I'm not a trained monkey. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't just respond and dance around for people. And the third reason is I'm not an easy lay. <laughs> They're all very good uh, reasons. You're off the hook, Frank. The first, one the, most, the first one is the purest and the truest. So tell me how you initially got the Yoda role, because you were already established as a puppeteer and performer at this point, but you weren't George Lucas's first choice, were you? I have no idea, wasn't I? Well, what, who, who else did you think of? Well, I heard that he went for someone that um, you were close to, uh, Jim Henson initially, who was busy and then recommended you. Is oh, that, I is besides, that, besides is that... Jim, I see. Yeah, Jim, you know, we were shooting the Muppet movie at that time. Gary Kurtz at that time went to Jim first. But Jim, you know, he, he was not only the head of the company and was too busy. There are a few things that he knew that I could do that he, I could do a little bit better than him. And he knew that this was an aspect of it, this this acting aspect. So... Uh, for those two reasons, first of all, he wouldn't have time. Uh, he suggested me. Coming up, Frank discusses the challenges of bringing Yoda to life, monkeys, and how the iconic way of speaking to be came. But first, I'd like to take this moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Fan Home. Fan Home is dedicated to bringing you unique collections, including this amazing new hardcover encyclopedia collection. As always with Fan Home, the quality is of the highest standard and the info is bang up to date, covering in detail droids, ships, characters, and and more. And early bird subscribers will even receive a special gift. So check out the Fan Home website using the link and unique promo code below to start collecting and to look as happy as this guy. Right, back to Frank, who we know isn't a performing monkey, but there were rumors that a primate was originally considered for the Yoda role. I heard that rumor, but I don't know if I believe it. I mean, you have to remember Yoda had words to say. Uh, I don't think 
the monkeys could say words at that time anyway. <laughs> so I, I question the, the, the validity of that rumor myself. Well, I guess uh, the voice would have been overlaid. I think the, the rumor is that it was a monkey wearing a mask with a cane. But anyway, humans prevailed. Um, so when you get to set uh, for rehearsals, what was the biggest challenge that you encountered with bringing this puppet to life? Two, one was physical, because this kind of thing had not been done before. I had to uh, have three people do it with me. It was difficult because uh, Stuart Friedborn, who was wonderful, uh, but he, he, had not, he had not made puppets. He made masks. He made Chewbacca and costumes. So he didn't quite understand the balance of things and the, and the grips and things like that, that the Muppet Workshop uh, knows backwards and forwards. So it was never quite right for me. So I had to kind of adjust it, the inside of it. On the other hand, Stewart did a beautiful job designing it and, uh, and it very much looked like him, as a matter of fact. The other aspect was getting four people in sync. If there's a glass here and, I just, and I'm looking over here and I reach for the glass and I drink it and I put it back, that's a piece of cake, no problem. But if you're four people and the glass is there, do, do your eyes go first or does your head go first? And, and if your eyes go first, then the head leads, follows, and then, and at what point you put out the arm? You can't put the arm out now. You don't see the glass, so you got to wait until the eyes see the glass, and then the hand reaches for the glass. Or do you move your head before the hand reaches for the? We had to break down every single movement like that with four mm -hmm. people, and I did the mouth and the uh, brow. Somebody else did the eyes. Somebody else did the hear, ears, and somebody else did the right hand. So all of us had to do that. So we had about two weeks of rehearsal and. That was the, the that's the that was the challenge is to make everything fluid and make it look like a, a, a all one person. And with the voice, with Yoda's way of speaking, that convoluted uh, syntax, uh, was a very confusing script presented to you or developed later? It did. No, no, it was actually a scene that was presented to me, and I said to, to George, and I because uh, at that time the Star Wars was so vastly popular that I think people would have loved to get the script. And so George gave each actor the scenes they were in only. But I said to George, I, I said, I, I can't do that. I, I, if Yoda is that wise, he has to know about everybody. He has to know about the Force. He has to know about Luke. He has to know about everybody and what they're doing during that time and what they're feeling. So in order to uh, use the Force to work with them. So... Uh, and George agreed and understood, so I, I read the whole script. Um, and um, at that time, the what people call backwards talk um, was only occasionally in there. It was George wrote that, or Larry wrote that. In any case, it was there, but it was only there half the time, and then it would go colloquial again, and then and go back to that. So I just asked George, "Can I, can I do that all the time?" And he said, yeah, sure. And so that's how that happened. Right. And it stuck. Yeah. And obviously, you know, it's, the voice is one element. Of course, you're the puppeteer. You're crawling around playing human Tetris in tight spaces to bring this character physically to life. You're part of the team. You're not just turning up and delivering some lines in a vocal booth. So I know all of these characters mean a lot to you. So when you put so much in like that, and you see the final result. When you see Yoda, the final result of Yoda on screen, can you? Were you satisfied? Can you ever be truly satisfied? Yeah, I. Uh, there are things I was unsatisfied with, but for that particular uh, movie, I had two weeks of rehearsal, so I had a lot of opportunity. Uh, I was not as satisfied with some of my other work because I only had two days of rehearsal. I think in Jedi or the first Jedi, rather Return and other things. So I, I wish I had more time to work with the four people. Um, but so I thought I could do better in certain instances. And sometimes I did fine. I was happy. I think the, the thing I'm happiest of all most, I think, is I feel very good about the work I did uh, when Yoda was explaining the force to Luke in Dagobah by the swamp. I feel uh, I feel very good about that. In part two, Frank continues to tolerate me as we talk about CGI versus puppets, Grogu, and more. Goodbye.